Psalm 107 O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, for he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness.
Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Welcome! The lesson you're about to hear is entitled, The Root of the Bible. We'll be investigating our relationship with God through accounts that have biblical trees in them, in the stories. So, it's not actually about trees, and we're not saying trees are extra special. We're just going to be looking at stories that have those events that have trees in them, and making points about how we can improve our relationship with God from those stories. One thing to consider first is etz, the Hebrew word for tree, also includes like vine and bush, and so there's going to be some things that aren't like what we think of trees in the lesson. So first look at Luke 19, and we'll read verses 1 through 10. Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he couldn't, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay in your house today. So he hurried and came down, and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone, I repay them fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to your house, since you also are a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So when we're looking at Zacchaeus and the sycamore, something we can take away first is Zacchaeus' initiative. So he's 
he's there when Jesus is coming in to the city and there's this great crowd and he knows that he wants to see Jesus. And so there's this obstacle before him and he he climbs the tree. Sometimes we let really little things stop us from going through on good things. Any small obstacle, we might say, oh, we can't see Jesus. Uh, too bad, I guess I'll just go back home. Or, oh, it'd be kind of embarrassing to go down in front of all those people, like climb out of a tree, that's kind of weird. But he recognizes God's value, so he risks some of those things. He realizes Jesus, he's a religious leader, and the Pharisees obviously think very very, very little of him. But he's willing to risk that because he recognizes Jesus' value. And that's something we should definitely be doing. We need to not let obstacles of any size stop us from getting closer to God. And on God's side of things, um, I have the story in Luke 15, the parable of the lost. He, he, Jesus is ready to receive us with open arms, just like the Father in that parable. He knows where we've been, and He's ready to accept us lovingly. So, next point, we're going to look at Luke chapter 6, verses 43 to 45. Luke 6, 43 to 45. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does any bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. The evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. So, what are we taking initiative to like have firsts in our lives, firsts in our hearts. We can see Zacchaeus was very interested. We don't know how much he knew, but we can see he's very interested in learning more about Jesus. It seems like he suspects that Jesus could be the thing he wants first in his life. And for us, like, what do we have first in our hearts? And if it's not good things, things that God wants us to take hold of, then we're just going to be producing evil. We're not going to be a blessing to those around us, not a light shining to others, pointing back to Jesus. It's just as absurd, Jesus says here, as like expecting a thorn bush to produce grapes. That's absolutely ridiculous. And we can't expect to have any good outcome for us if we're not in that root, if we're the wrong kind of plant. And we have control over that. Alright, the next point, go ahead and turn to John chapter 15. We'll be looking at where Jesus calls himself the true vine and tells those there what that entails. So, John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear even more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch, and withers. The branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to, my, to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So what, what do we see looking at those points where Jesus says, I am the true vine? Well, he's saying that when we're aligned with him, one with him, branches coming off of his, his root, that we get to experience this joy. We get to be at peace. And toward the, toward the beginning, he talks about those unfruitful branches, they're going to be cut off. We're not going to have chance of life. It's not as if we can support ourselves in any meaningful way without Jesus. About halfway through the passage, he says, Without me, apart from me, you can do nothing. We're, we're helpless without Jesus. So when we have unity, we share in this oneness between the Son and the Father there. We get to experience the love that he promises there. He says that your joy may be full. So if we're independent from that, we get withered, we're cut off, we burn. There's no chance of life that way. And also, if we're unfruitful, we're not bearing good fruit, Jesus isn't going to keep you on, on his vine. But if we are taking initiative, kind of like we saw Zacchaeus in the last story, seeking him out and then taking that next step to do his commandments, then he's going to test us. He's going to help us grow to continue to bear more and more fruit. And all this productivity and oneness with Christ is going to give us joy and love and peace and lots of it. But we, we make mistakes. We don't always do that. And we're going to look at some, some examples of humans not taking advantage of what God offers. So first, look at Jonah chapter 4. Go ahead and turn there. Jonah chapter 4. We're going to read the whole thing. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew, knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city, and he made a booth for himself there. He sat it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 1,200,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? All right, so remember that, and we'll come back to that some more after we read this next passage. Esther chapter 5. We'll start in verse 9. Esther chapter 5. And Haman went out that day, and was glad of heart, and joyful. 
But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he sent and brought his friends and his, and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, and all the promotions which the king had granted to him, and how he had advanced above all the officials and servants of the king. And then Haman said, Even Queen Esther left no one or let no one but me come with the king to the feast that she prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let us sake fifty cubits high be made, in the morning, tell the king to have Mordecai executed upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the stake made. So in these two stories, we see this, this selfishness and arrogance of these two characters, Jonah and Haman. With Jonah, he's... Jonah is valuing that vine selfishly just because it's comforting him. He, it's kind of disgusting that he, he values it more than all the people of Nineveh. He just hates them so much. And he, he believes in God's power. It seems like he even despises God for his love and because it's preventing the Ninevites from getting punished. And we don't know if he's taking that all the way to him. Like, if God doesn't offer that love to the Ninevites, like, that doesn't leave Jonah in a good place either. But it doesn't seem like he cares about that. He just despises God's plan for him, and the contrast between his pity for the vine and his hatred for all of Nineveh is... Yeah, it's in stark contrast to God's love and His mercy, how He wants them to, the Ninevites to, and even Jonah, the Ninevites and Jonah to come in and be with Him, to change. And this vine is a gift from God to Jonah. It says God gives it to him so he finds some comfort. And it made, made me think when I was reading through there, like, there's so many blessings God gives us, and sometimes we elevate them to that first place in our heart, kind of like we were talking about with the, the good things in our hearts and the evil things, and also with Zacchaeus. Like, all these things are from God, and yet sometimes we forget to thank Him, to remember that those are actually from God. We just end up attributing those things to ourselves, or just not even thinking about it. And Haman, we can definitely see lots of arrogance and hatred there, too. With, with Haman, he has, seems like he has this self-image he's built up. We see when he's upset by seeing Mordecai, he gathers all his friends, and he seems like he's trying to make himself feel better by basically bragging to them. Uh, the king's done all this stuff for me, and I have this many sons, and the queen Esther has invited me to the feast. No one else except the king is going there. It's just me and the king. But we can also see just how weak that his, his value system is, because just because of one man, Mordecai, he, he feels complete despair. He says, all... All the stuff he has is worth nothing to him because Mordecai doesn't care about that. It seems like Mordecai is reminding Haman just how wasteful and useless all those things he values are. And Haman's hatred toward Mordecai goes so far that 
He's willing to kill all the Jews in the kingdom and have Mordecai executed on this, this tree, this stake. It's really disgusting. And sometimes we let things get that out of hand. Not, not usually in the same kind of way, but we can let, just let ourselves get completely blinded toward what's important when we get that anger and selfishness take root in our heart instead of those good gifts that God would like us to have there. Next we'll look at 1 Kings 19, looking at Elijah beneath the broom tree. So in the spot before our reading, Jezebel has just said that she's going to kill Elijah. She is so furious at him for humiliating her prophets and also leading to them being killed on Mount Carmel. And she is just distraught with Elijah. And Elijah is scared that the queen of the country wants him dead. And he goes off in the wilderness and he ends up beneath this broom tree in the middle of this this dry time in Israel, this famine. And what we see is, if we start reading in verse 4, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down underneath the broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough for me now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under the broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose, ate and drank, and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. So, after this, we can see, outside of just the food, God provides and comfort for Elijah, telling him that he isn't alone, that God is with him, there are other people who are following God as well. And... No, it's really enlightening, I, I guess I'd say, to see Elijah, one of these great biblical heroes, at this low point. He's struggling. He's discouraged. He's, he's scared for his life. Jezebel has said she's going to kill him. And, you know, that obviously is a weakness on his part, but God is providing comfort for him. He still expects Elijah to go out and do his duty as God instructs him. And he, God tells him what that is there on Mount Horeb. But he also provides and comforts Elijah. He gives him this food here. He, he tells him that he's not alone. And Elijah is reminded of that and goes on to be, be very courageous in what he does after this. But, unlike the hatred and arrogance we see from the characters we just looked at, God is going to comfort us. He understands us. He's our creator. He supports us if we're striving to be in unity with him, like branches on the vine. And Psalm 1 also kind of continues this point, this contrast between... Elijah and between Jonah and Haman. So, Psalm 1, starting in verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. 
In all, that he, in all that he does, he prospers. But the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the path of the wicked will perish. So after reading this, we can see, it kind of sounds like a, what we saw in John with Jesus calling himself the true vine. In verse 4 we see, it says, the wicked are like chaff in the wind, they're being driven away, and just like when we're not one with God, not trying to align or gain, being sustained by Him, or we're just being unfruitful, unproductive, we're being wicked, we're going to be gathered up, thrown in the fire, or like it says here, driven away like chaff. It just... We can't stand on our own. We don't have the root or the foundation. The righteous, by contrast, in verse 3 are shown by the example of a tree by still water, by a stream of water. And this tree, it's being productive. It's making lots of fruit. It's being sustained in this good soil. It's, it's not withering. It says, and all that it does and all that he does, it prospers. And verse 2, we're kind of working our way backwards. It's pro he's prospering because his delight is the law of the Lord. He's meditating it on it day and night. So, he's staying away from sinners. He's focusing in on God. And that makes him stand strong. And that's very different from the examples of human foolishness we looked at, Jonah and Haman. And that's the way we should be striving to, is like this tree in Psalm 1. Alright, one of our last examples is in Genesis 35. So, go ahead and turn there, Genesis 35, verses 1 through 4. Jacob here buries his idols underneath a terebinth tree. Verse 1, God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar to, to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves. Change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to God who answers me in the day of my distress, has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had, and the rings that were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under a terebinth tree that was in Shechem. So here, one of the first things to remember is, Jacob hasn't always been a godly person. When we first meet him, he's working with his mother to deceive his father. He, it's kind of like that treacherous trickster when we first meet him. And as we go on through his story, we see he kind of gets paid back a little bit for that from Laban, getting tricked by him. We can also see that by this point, God, or Jacob, has, he's recognizing God. God blessed him abundantly while he was down there with his uncle, even despite that uh, getting a taste of his own medicine. He, he has all these children, he has all, this, all these possessions as he's heading back toward his home. And Jacob recognizes these blessings he has from God. And he's removing obstacles from his life. And in this case, they're literal idols. And he he buries them under this tree and makes an altar to worship God. And you know, what are we treasuring in our hearts? Like the evil things or the good things? Are we being blinded by hate and pride or are we striving to 
put God first in our lives. And we see here, Jacob is taking the initiative, seeing God's value, and he cuts those things out. And we need to do the same thing. In Genesis chapter 2, it talks about the tree of life being in the midst of the garden. Adam and Eve are there with God, and they're good. They're the tree of life there in the garden kind of sets this is like the central setting there for a place where God is with humans in this good relationship. And that's that's what we get to kind of be a part of when we're being aligned with God. We're being branches, being productive for Him, not being distracted by hate or greed or all these other passing things. So just just like it's like he's just taking the initiative and Elijah is being comforted and sustained by God. Jacob's cutting these things out of his life that he realizes are no good to him. We need to also dedicate ourselves to God. Remember that if we're trying to stand our own, we're just like a branch that falls off a great tree. We're, we're not going to be able to do anything by ourselves. We can't support ourselves. We'll just be blown away or gathered up for fire. So I hope that looking at these different stories with, with trees in them has been helpful for everyone hearing this and will inspire you to grow closer to God. Thank you for listening.